All right, you all know this guy, right? Karl Marx, died over 130 years ago. He believed that society for, were formed by class conflict. And he believed that the primary problem, or I'm sorry, the primary characteristic of an industrialized society was the imbalance of power, because you had the people that owned all the land and all the machinery, and well, there wasn't a lot of machinery back then, but you know, they owned all the wealth, and they had the workers. And that was a problem for him. He wanted everyone to be equal. So what did he propose was a, a revolution. I know you all know about Karl Marx, so I'm not going to go into this too much, but when he started his awful theory, it carried over into the 1920s with the Frankfurt School. While all the, I want you to understand, CRT, critical race theory, and critical theory is not new. It didn't just happen in the last couple of years. This has been going on for decades. We could even say over a century. In 1963, I want to tell you what the communist, Marxism is communist, is communistic. They want people to revolt. They need a boogeyman and they need chaos. What we are seeing in our society is exactly what has been planned. This is how the Marxists take over countries. It's how it happened in Russia. It's how it happened in China. This, we are headed, we are the blueprint. It's just being put down right on our country. So in 1963, there were 45 communist goals that were read into the US, into the US congressional record. And in 1963, things were going fairly well in America and we're thinking, this, is, this can't happen. But I, I just wanna read you a couple of things. I'm not gonna read you every 45 goal, but the ones that I think are really important for you to understand. Here's what they said about the founding of America. Goal number 29, discredit the American Constitution by calling it inadequate, old-fashioned, out of step with modern needs, a hindrance to cooperation between nations on a worldwide basis. Does that sound like it's happening? Number 30, discredit the American Mount founding fathers. Present them as selfish aristocrats who had no concern for common man. Number 31, belittle all forms of American culture and discourage the teaching of American history on the ground that it was only a minor part of the big picture. Number 42, Create the impression that violence and insurrection are legitimate aspects of American tradition, that students and special interest groups should rise up and use united force to solve economic, political, and social problems. What did we see all last summer? Okay, so these things were happening back in the 60s, but not like we're seeing it's mainstream now. Here's what these goals said about the schools. Number 17. Get control of the schools. Use them as transmission belts for socialism and current communistic, communistic, communist propaganda. Soften the curriculum. Get control of teachers associations. Put the party line in textbooks. Check. They've done all those things. Number 19, use student riots to foment public protests against programs or organizations which are under communist attack. Here's what they say about the family and morality. This is 1963, read into the congressional record. Number 24, eliminate all laws governing obscenity by calling them censorship and a violation of free speech and free press. Number 25, break down cultural standards of morality by promoting pornography and obscenity in books, magazines, motion pictures, radio, and TV. Number 26, 1963 now, Present homosexuality, degeneracy, and promiscuity as normal, natural, and healthy. They did that one too, didn't they? Number 27, infiltrate the churches and replace revealed religion with social religion. Discredit the Bible and emphasize the need for intellectual maturity, which does not need a religious crutch. Number 40, discredit the family as an institution. Encourage promiscuity and easy divorce. And number 41, emphasize the need to raise children away from the negative influence of their parents. Attribute pre prejudices, mental blocks, and retarding of children to suppressive influence of parents. So I read these things just to let you know, the, this has been in the works for a long time. In 1963, I don't think people were really thinking it would happen. I think 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it would be hard to think that we are where we are today. 
So this has just been going on for a long time. As you heard, these are evil things. These are anti-biblical types of things. CRT says that you are a racist and you cannot change. That's not what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us to, that we can change. We can be forgiven. We can be friends with each other. Um, CRT is about no forgiveness, holding on to a grudge. God tells us not to um, judge people by their outward appearance. CRT is all about the outward appearance. I am so appreciative of our pastor. Grady is here. It's his day off. He's got company in town from out of state. Thank you for coming to help us with the PowerPoint. But I want to say, many churches will ignore CRT and say, oh, it's political. Or they embrace the nonsense of it and are teaching it. And it is anti-biblical. It is anti-Christian. So I thank you for standing bold and standing for truth and protecting your flock from lies. So thank you for that. Okay, Karl Marx was using the rich against the poor. They've been able to take down countries all across the world using the rich and the poor. Well, in America, that's a lot harder to do because you can be born with nothing, but if you work hard, you can be a millionaire. And so this battle of rich and poor does not work in America, and they've been really frustrated. It's been taking too long. So they decided in 1970s, let's go with race because that's something that doesn't change. You're, you're with it your whole life, and that is how we got to where we're going. It is a, a woman from China. She lived in China until she was in her 20s when Mao was taking over. And this is exactly the same thing they did. But they did it with age. They did it with society. They didn't um, do it with, like how we're seeing it so much with race. But she sees this is the exact same thing. They even called it woke in China. Everything. I mean, she brings out so many things in there that this is exactly what we're seeing. More developments tonight on how parents and common sense Americans are pushing back against the destructive far left critical race theory ideology that's infiltrating America's schools. Just listen to how one Virginia mom who actually survived Mao, China, eviscerates her local school board amid the district's critical race theory push. Take a look at this. I've been very alarmed about what's going on in our school. You are now teaching, training our children to be social justice warriors and to loathe our country and our history. Uh, growing up in Mao's China, all this seemed very familiar. The uh, communist regime used the same critical theory to divide people. The only difference is they use class instead of race. This is indeed the American version of the Chinese communist, the Chinese cultural revolution. The critical race theory has its roots in cultural Marxism. It should have no place in our schools. And down in the great state of Florida, Governor Ron DeSantis continues to be a beacon of hope against this far-left lunacy as the Florida Board of Education has approved the governor's rule banning teaching of critical race theory in the state's public schools. Joining us now for reaction, Fox News contributor Jason Chavitz, along with the mother you just saw in that video, Shee Van Fleet is with us. You were six years old when the Cultural Revolution began in China. And... You That's have spoken correct. eloquently about what it was like in school and posters hung in hallways and teachers and students would, would attack each other for being ideologically impor, impure. Can you explain what you experienced and, and the similarities you see? Okay. Um, I just want to uh, uh, let the American people know that what's going on in our school and in our country is really a replay of the Cultural Revolution um, in China. And uh, I, I want people to see there is uh, similarities, and the similarities are terrifying. They use the same uh, ideology and same methodology, even the same vocabulary, and with the same goal. The uh, uh, ideology is uh, cultural Marxism. And uh, we were divided uh, into groups as oppressor and oppressed. And here we use race, and there they use class. And uh, um, the, the, uh, um, the people here who have a different review were labeled racist 
But uh, in the Cultural Revolution, the label is counter-revolutionary. So it is a hat that fits all. And once the hat is on your head, your life is ruined. And the, the tech, uh, uh, methodology is also very similar. It's cancel culture. We basically cancel the whole Chinese civilization pre-communism. And we changed our school names, street names, store names. We changed even our personal names. My name is Xi, and I was named after the city I was born, Xi'an. Xi means West. It also refers to the imperialism. So I wanted so bad to change my name because I want to be more uh, communist. I'm glad my parents convinced me not to. And the vocabulary is even this, uh, the same, wokeness. And uh, to be specific, we used class wokeness. In Chinese, it's, uh, it is jie ji jue wu. Your level of uh, um, wokeness determine uh, your chance to get a promotion or to get benefit. And who decides your level of uh, wokeness? It is the party leaders. Yeah. And, yeah. and, uh, and, 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 and you and, speak. And you speak from real experience. I mean, you were six years old, but you lived 20 years under this oppression. And it sounds like out of the lessons you learned under Mao and the revolution, you see this group think now appearing in America, and you're trying to warn Americans that you don't want to go down this road. Um, Congressman Chaffetz, let me ask you. I mean, you see what, what is being taught here. What is your reaction, and, and do you see the similarities? Uh, I do see the similarities, but to hear it firsthand from Xi, uh, I'm just proud of her for speaking up. I'm proud of her for doing it the American way and actually going out of her comfort zone and making an issue of this. So on behalf of millions of people all across this country, thank you for doing that. Uh, I'm very proud of what Ron DeSantis is doing. You know, he was on our oversight committee. He was pretty good. But you know what? As governor, the guy is great. And um, he's doing the right thing. But it's going to take ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And so I just want to thank her for voicing what so many millions of people and parents know is happening. And we got to change it. I'll give you the last word, um, Siobhan Fleet, because I think... What would your message be to America if they continue to go down this road? I just want people to know that the freedom is fragile, and uh, we can lose it any time if we don't defend it. And there's a lot of uh, um, Chinese Americans who have the same experience and share my point of view. And I know that more and more people will st uh, step up and share their stories and tell the American people criti uh, critical race theory is not anti-racism. It itself is racist. It's divisive, it's destructive, and it is dangerous. All right. Thank you so much. I'm sorry you had to live that way. And Congressman, it's great to see you as always. If you saw the Great Reset last month with Becca Blocker, America is the only country standing in the way of the Great Reset. The Great Reset is the World Economic Forum's plan, and it's been in the works for over 50 years, to have the whole world on the same level. CRT is a major accomplishment to bring us down. If, we, if they don't bring us down, we can push off the Great Reset a little bit, but they need our country to bring the whole world down. And so I, I really am glad you're here, and I'm glad that you're, you're going to listen to what Kate Carl has to say. Come on up and tell us all about Frederick Douglass. And... How's everyone doing? Thank you so much uh, for asking me to come, Becky. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. Those who don't know me, you look familiar. <laughs> My name is Kate Carl Smith. I live in Trustville. Uh, Alabama, of course, and I've been speaking, traveling the country for the past 11, 12 years, preaching to the choir. I purposely go out and I preach to the conservative choir to teach the choir how to go out and bring in new choir members and give the choir a new song to sing. The hymns are okay, but it's not the best way to go sometimes. So I give them a new hymn called the Frederick Douglass Republican Melody. So what I've been doing for the past 11 years, 12 years, God has given the message where I teach conservatives 
and empower them with the knowledge, the confidence, and the skill on how to win the narrative, how to trump the race car, pun intended. Because if we don't do that, we're on the defense all the time. We got to be on the offense all the time. So because of that success doing that for the past 12 years, um, for the last two years of his in office, I was the advisor to President Trump for the last two years while he was in office, behind the scenes talking about diversity and engagement and how to make that happen. President Trump's not the problem. His advisors are the problem. And so, so the time I have with, I got 25 minutes, and I can't cover everything, but I think I'm going to cover, I put my notes to the side. I'm going to talk from the heart to the heart about what's going on in our country and to give you a sense of empowerment on how we can defeat Marxism and send the left back to France. Okay? You're going to know how to do that. But in order to do that, the first thing that we must do as conservatives is not to engage people with truth, evidence, and facts, and statistics. Why? No one's listening to us. That word conservative has a, has a racist connotation. As soon as you tell someone you are a conservative, you just grew seven heads, and the attack is on. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what truth you speak. We have already been discredited when we get a chance to speak. Because the left, unfortunately, has done a fantastic job of, doing, of uh, demonizing that word. Let me play this audio for you. It's about a minute and 20 seconds long. I'm not going to tell you who it is. You will recognize the voice. And uh, I'll let him speak for himself. We've come to respect this man and to love him. So listen up. I'm say this, but uh, being honest with you and with myself is, is paramount. And I can tell you, and you know this without me telling you, that if, if conservatism and liberalism are brands, the left has succeeded in destroying the, destroying the brand of conservative. All you have to say the word conservative and they think you're talking about a Nazi or a racist. Pushing conservatism is not the answer. So what I would suggest to you, when you're out and about and you're doing, if you, if you run a, a, into an, a, an occasion where you have the opportunity to talk politics, people that don't agree with you, do not use the word conservative. Do everything else, but don't call yourself that. Don't promote it. We've got a brand problem. It's time we, I, I hate it. I hate having to admit it. Get rid of it. Stop calling yourself that. Just be one. Just talk to people as one. You know what I think? I think you're going to find, if we do this, that you're going to have far more people agree with your solutions than will disagree if you don't identify yourself first as a conservative would talk. Nobody needs to abandon conservatism. It's just stop labeling everything we think or do as conservative and just do it. You recognize that voice, right? So Rush Limbaugh agrees with me. Rush, Rush made that comeback back in 2018, doing a third hour of the show in November 2018. I've been advocating this for the past 12 years, that we have a brand problem. And stop using the word conservative as your political identity because it puts you on the defense. So the question is, okay, Carl, what is that? How should we identify ourselves where we can win this narrative? I am a conservative, but in terms of my political identity, I am a Frederick Douglass Republican. And what I mean by that, I believe the life and power and values of Frederick Douglass. Respect for the U.S. Constitution, respect for life. I believe the limited power of government, where I like to keep more of the money that I make. I believe in economic prosperity, free speech, school's choice, right to keep and bear arms, legal immigration. Frederick Douglass wrote about these things, and he lived it. You follow me? Now, this whole, I'm saying this first because before I get into the critical race theory, we got to understand if we're going to win and to save our nation, it's going to be about messaging. It's going to be about us being able to engage our family members, our friends, and people who may not look like us regarding the importance of liberty and what's going on in our country regarding the, criti the critical race theory. 
But in order to do that, we have to win the narrative. And it's not going to be done under the umbrella of conservatism. That word has been demonized. It's gone. It's gone. I was at a friend's home one day. We were watching a football game. There were 18 to 20 blacks who were there. All of them were black Democrats. And the subject of politics came up that night. When I told my friends that I was a conservative Republican, the attacks began. They called me everything but a child of God. Uncle Tom, foot shuffle, a house nigga. Your parents must be disappointed in you. How can you, do, how can you do such a thing? I went home that night thinking and mostly praying about how I can best articulate my conservative values so I can win this narrative and win them. A year later, after God has perfected this messaging strategy in me, I invited those same 18 to 20 black Democrat friends of mine to my home to watch our favorite football team play on television, and reluctantly, they all came. And the subject of politics surfaced. And they said, okay, cause a conservative Republican. I said, wait a minute, I'm more than a conservative. I am more than a Republican. I am a Frederick Douglass Republican, and I believe in life and power and values of Frederick Douglass. When I said that, all of them started talking about how they were a Frederick Douglass Republican too. <laughs> it worked. If we're serious about defending liberty, if we're serious about defeating Marxism, we must make the liberty message of Frederick Douglass and integrate that into our own. The life of Frederick Douglass is inspiring. You got the life and you have his writings. Quickly about his life, born 1818. By the way, Karl Marx and Frederick Douglass were both born in 1818. I'm gonna say some more about that in a minute. Uh, Frederick Doug was born below poverty. Why do I say that? Because he was, he was born into slavery. Slavery is below poverty. He was a slave for the first 20 years of his life. Never slept in the bed to age 8, never owned a pair of shoes to age 10. He was homeschooled, self-taught. He started his own homeschooling program. You know why? Because he rejected the slave master's common core curriculum. Y'all get that? <laughs> Eric, you get that? Let me fast forward a little bit. Douglas escaped from slavery at the age of 20, 1838. Here's some tidbits about Douglas's life that's gonna blow your mind. He had zero days of formal schooling, never to school in his life. He was all homeschooled. Frederick Douglas wrote three autobiographies. He didn't have a ghostwriter. That brother wrote three books. I make that point because based on my reading of history, at that time in our country, 90% of blacks could not read or write. That brother wrote three books, and he wrote a novel called The Heroic Slave. Frederick Douglass was an advisor to five Republican presidents. Five Republican presidents. Abraham Lincoln, Ulysses S. Grant, James Garfield, Rutherford Hayes, Benjamin Harrison. Most folks don't get a chance to meet one president. That brother was advisor to five U.S. presidents. Here's something that blew my mind. Frederick Douglass passed away in 1895. Karl Marx passed away in 1883, I believe. When Douglass passed away, at the time of his death, he had $300,000 in savings. Back then, in terms of today's money, that's over $10 million. So what I like about that is this. No matter which victim category that the left the Marxists try to put people in, no one, no American today can out-victimize Frederick Douglass. Now that's his life. Let's get into the writings, because this is key now. It is the writings of Frederick Douglass that we have to leverage to defeat Marxism. We're going to leverage the writings of a guy who's a former slave. So when he writes about free speech, personal responsibility, the, the, the Constitution, women's rights, he writes having a slave perspective. The left has no answer for that, and they never will. Let me give you an example. Douglas said this about the Constitution one time. Douglas said, quote, the Constitution reads, we the people. It does not read, we the white people, Douglas said. He concluded by saying, if blacks are considered to be people, then they should be benefactors of the Constitution. He closed it out by saying the problem, is, the problem is not with the Constitution. The problem is in the application of the Constitution. 
The problem is not with the Bible. The problem is in how the Bible is applied. So thank God we have the literary legacy of Frederick Douglass to refute the lies and the false rhetoric of the Marxists. We should be thankful for that. Now, we got to win the narrative. We, we got to have a, a, a different way of identifying ourselves. Let me, let me say this. To be a Frederick Douglass Republican is not based on your skin color. It's not about color, it's about values. A Frederick Douglass Republican is a person who embraces what we call the life-empowering values of Frederick Douglass. Now, I didn't say conservative values, life-empowering values, okay? In lieu of saying conservative. What are those life-empowering values, Kay Carl? Well, you heard me mention them before. Respect for the U.S. Constitution, respect for life, the belief in limited power of government, economic prosperity, free speech, school choice, women's rights, the right to keep and bear arms, religious liberty. Douglas wrote all these, about all these things. You follow me? It will behoove us to leverage that and integrate that into our message when we talk to people. Now, let me get into this critical race theory. Okay, when you take a look at the critical race theory, and Becky already mentioned this, the first bullet says, I don't want to insult your intelligence, but I'm going to have to read it to make sure I'm on, I'm on tap. Black people are perpetual, helpless victims of white racism. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a slave for life. That's what it's saying. What I'm going to do, these things here, that brother looks familiar in the back. Hey, Troy. We're going to cover this right quick. But what, what I did recently, as I started studying this whole critical race theory, I, I, I said the best way to dismantle this whole argument is to deal with racism or analyze racism when it was at its worst in the United States. That was in Douglas's time. So I said, well then, let me go back and see what did Frederick Douglass have to say about these things here? Because this is what the, the critical race theory asserts, that black people are helpless, uh, perpetual helpless victim of white racism. What did Douglass say about that? Did he? I don't know. I'm going to share something with you. Number two, white people are innately racist with absolutely no redeeming qualities. My, my problem is, how, if that's true, how do white liberals get excluded from that? <laughs> Come on. How do, you, how do you get excluded from that? They managed to do it, right? What they're saying is conservatives are racist. Anybody who believes in free speech and the Constitution, they're racist. But white liberals get a pass? What did Douglas say about that? How, how would Douglas address that? The third one, CRT primarily, is primarily about silencing truth and changing people's private worship from God to government. They want us to bow down to the altar of the almighty government where we depend on them and see the government as our resource and not our God. Whew. I'm going to share a quote with you from Douglas on this that blows that out of the water. Matter of fact, what I'm going to share with you blows all of it out of the water. You ready? Is that up there? The quote from Douglas? Oh. oh that's right. Put it up there. Is it, on, is it up here? I'll talk it. Um, what I, I brought some cards with me. I, we came up with this thing called the Frederick Douglass Republican on Critical Race Theory. And I brought some cards with me. I'm not here to hawk the cards. Yes, I am. I'm going to hawk them. Because it works. This card I'm going to share with you, when I had it published last week, my brother's the pastor of a church. And I shared the card with some members of our church who are members of BLM. Change your thinking. Here's what I learned. They never heard the liberty message coming from the writings of Frederick Douglass. Never heard it. Here's the contrast. Frederick Douglass, born 1813. Karl Marx was born 1813. Karl Marx was born to, his father was a lawyer. Karl Marx came from white privilege. I told that to BLM. I said, 
The thing that you despise, white privilege, Karl Marx came from that. You call yourself a, a, a trained Marxist and you believe in Marxism. I said, I believe in Frederick Douglassism. And I shared that card with them. Because one, one of them came back and said about the Constitution being a pro-slavery document, Douglass wrote about that, that specific subject. I shared it with them. Silence. Learn the leverage for the Douglas. Let me take one of those. I'm not going to read all three of them. I'm just going to read one. The one I like is the last one where Douglas hits this about that the changing our private worship. And I don't have my glasses on, so bear with me. You going to read it to me? I don't want to use your glasses, but number three on the second page. This evil tactic is identical to the approach used by the plantation slave masters. In his 1850 speech, The Nature of Slavery, Douglas warned us, quote, the first work of slavery is to mar and deface those characteristics of its victim with distinguish, which distinguish men from things and persons from property. Its first aim is to destroy all sense of high moral and religious responsibility. It reduces man to a mere machine. It cuts him from his, off from his maker it hides him from the laws of God and leaves him to grope his way from time to eternity in the dark under the arbitrary, arbitrary and despotic control of frail, depraved, and sinful fellow man. That's it. The greatest liberty messenger in the history of our country is Frederick Douglass. I also say that Frederick Douglass is the forgotten prophet. He was an ordained preacher. So... I'll be here the rest of the night. I'm not going to take all the time here, but I'll be the rest of the night. But I, want, I do want to share the things I brought. Uh, I wrote a book back in 2011 that I still can't keep on my shelf. It's called Frederick Douglass Republicans, The Movement to Reignite America's Passion for Liberty. It is not a dissertation on the political thoughts of Douglass. What the book is, it is a conservative action handbook. It's a book that you need that teaches you how, how to engage. How to leverage Frederick Douglass. Why Frederick Douglass? The book comes with five engagement cards. Uh, on the engagement card, there are six life-empowering values. What did Douglass say about the Constitution? Free speech, women's rights, personal responsibility. That's on the engagement card. Once you read the book, the engagement card is what you give the people so they can have an awakening. In addition to the book and those five cards, I have the CRT card. They come in stack of 20, and I'm giving it at my cost. Uh, so it's $10 for 20. And that thing is, that thing will change the tide of what's going on in this country. Learn how to identify yourself differently. Don't stop being a conservative, but understand that word has been so demonized, you're creating a wall as soon as you say you're a conservative. Learn to leverage Frederick Douglass. Learn, learn about his life. Because you just can't say Frederick Douglass Republican or talk about what Douglass said about critical race theory with his quotes and don't have the content to come behind it. You got to get K. Carl's book. The, the card, the cards, the six by nine front and back, is you get 20 cards for $10. The book and the five cards, the book is free. The autograph in each book <laughs> is $15. Okay? God bless you. I'll be here all night. Thank you for inviting me. So these are, these are, uh, there's more than these four things that are being taught, but this is what our children are being taught in school. This is what our government and your work environment, if you do diversity and equity training, that's what this is. This is exactly what this is. These are some of the buzzwords that you're going to hear with critical race theory. Some of these look familiar to you. Microaggressions. Remember hearing that a few years ago. Multiculturalism. Spirit murdering. Okay, that, that's not a mainstream one that you hear a lot, but woke. Um, white social capital. White privilege. White fragility. Diversity training. When you hear the word diversity training that's been going on for 20 years, Take a look at what they're actually teaching in diversity training. If you own a company or you work in a company like Alabama Power or where they do diversity training, Dr. Carol Swain has a curriculum 
that teaches diversity training, but she teaches the other side of it. She teaches the good, the good stuff. Intersectionality. I want to I want to explain a, a couple of words that you hear a lot. When I first heard the word intersectionality, I, I kept hearing people talk about it, and it sounded like such a big word, but I really didn't know what it meant, and I was kind of embarrassed. So I did a little research, and here I'm going to share with you, in case you don't know what it is. Think of like a graph or a, a categories. Okay, so we all are either an oppressor or we're oppressed. This is, this is how critical race theory, you're one or the other. But you have different levels. So if you are a white man versus a black man, you're, the, the white man is higher on the scale of evil than the black man in critical race theory. If you are a black woman versus a black man, she is more oppressed than just the black man. If, the, if she's a straight black woman, and then you compare her to a transgender black woman, this one is gonna be more oppressed, okay? If you're a Christian, if you come from a two-parent family, if you're married, if you're straight, if you're transgender, if you, all, if you have a good job, all of these things are categorized. And that's what intersectionality is. It's where you fall on the scale. So not only when people talk about critical race and you start hearing them think about intersectionality, think these are people that are looking at outward issues. They're, they're looking at, you know, are you single? Are you married? Are you gay? They are judging you and in intersectionality, the more victimized you are, the more authority you have to talk about these things. If you're a white straight man making good money, married, have kids, whatever, you need to sit down and shut up. You could pretty much say what CRT stands for is shut up whitey. Sit down, shut up, whitey. It, this is so racist. Okay, examples. Are they in your schools? Yes, they're in your schools. Did you hear um, Mountain Brook got their diversity training? Uh, they saw the curriculum for the diversity training that their teachers were learning. And they went crazy. The Anti-Defamation League had this wonderful Stop the Hate campaign, and they were training all their teachers. Well, they got a hold of it. And they realized what was really being taught. And it was all about racism. You hear about children in second grade coming home from school, crying, wanting to commit suicide because everyone in their class hates them because they are white and they are the oppressor. This is really happening. Someone in Texas that happened to, and she went to the school board meeting and went crazy. These parents got together and they wrote a 12-page document about what exactly, we want to show everybody what the diversity training is, that's being taught. Well, it's really hard to get your hands on what the teachers are being taught. They don't want parents to know. They don't want people to know what they're training the teachers and then what the teachers are gonna be training your children. We have, uh, okay, this book right here, down in Dothan, one of our small groups in Dothan went to, some of the folks went to the, the school board, local school board meeting. They were adopting this textbook. Take a picture of it if you've got kids in high school. Advanced Placement, World History 1200 to Present. They skimmed through the book and it reflects Karl Marx's interpretation of history. Um, it promotes world government throughout the United Nations. It is all Marxist. So this is in Alabama. I, there's a lot more than this. These are just specific examples that I wanted to be able to show you. Representative Ed Oliver is from District 81. Um, Ed, come on up and Thank you for being here. And tell us what got you interested in, he was into CRT before he even knew what CRT was. And then tell us about your bill. Uh, thank you, Ed Oliver, of course. Uh, and uh, she said, I'm not out of it. I was put to sleep this morning. My kids drove me over here. And when I left the house, they said, daddy's off the rails. <laughs> so, so just so you know. Uh, I actually had a child that went to the University of Alabama, still goes, she's a senior in nursing at the university. And I kept hearing the stories about indoctrination training and uh, woke culture, and even heard her reflecting in her conversations, things where I'm going, baby, that's, that's not what we believe. And uh, that's when it hits home. 
A uh, couple moved here from California and brought their two kids with them. Uh, I happened to meet them because a real estate agent wanted to use my boat over on Lake Martin to ride them around. So nice folks. Uh, their daughter, one of their daughters, was in school with my daughter, same sorority, and they started talking. And they were ready to get out of California. They came to look at Lake Martin, and they moved, lock, stock, and barrel, loaded up the wagon, and away they were gone. Well, the second child goes to the university, and she is in an indoctrination class for freshmen. If you're going to participate in Rush, you had to go through this diversity training. Well, she was in tears when she called her parents. Her uncle was a policeman. When she stood up and defended her uncle and said she disagreed with the things that they were saying about the police, they used the tactic of gaslighting. Because you're white and your uncle is a policeman, you have no redemption. You need to be taken out and killed, basically. And that's kind of how the mentality works. There's nothing you can do to redeem yourself. So uh, I have bad temperament, I, I, I will admit that. And sometimes it's easier to wake up in the morning being angry with somebody. It's great motivation. <laughs> you know, you, 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 don't, you don't sit there and drink coffee all day. You're, you're doing something. So, uh, and some other things were occurring. I, I'd actually conversed with the university several times and, and gotten no satisfactory response. Uh, did get offered some good football tickets. But, uh, you know, that, that's what they always do with legislators. By the way, I am a legislator. And most folks think that you can offer legislators things like money or gifts, and that's how you get what you want. I don't know anybody, anybody, and my friend Mike Holmes will tell you that, I don't know anybody that that influences. No one. I make decisions for my district, and I do it uh, based on how I feel about a particular issue. Uh, I, you and I have not agreed on 100% of the things we do. We all make our decisions, uh, try to do them in a vacuum. Uh, anyhow, we get to this point where, where I'm looking for something to do. And then it suddenly occurs to me that critical race theory is all over TV, and I'm trying to fight all these woke people. Maybe I need to do a little more research here and see where, where we are. The next thing you know, I have found a bunch of people that are willing to help, and uh, I was able to come up with a bill, not that I'm smart enough to do it by myself, I promise, but some smart lawyers that understand the Constitution. And a lot of times you'll see legislators come up with bills that make a great statement. You know, it's what we call a red meat bill. It gets everybody all excited, but it really doesn't do anything. And plus, those are very difficult to pass. They're legal challenges, all that sort of thing. So we approached it from the point of view that we wanted a bill that we could pass that would make a difference in the state. So the first thing we did is we didn't define CRT and didn't name CRT. We don't call this critical race theory anywhere in here. Uh, what it does do is right here on it, it does uh, go a little farther than just schools. You see most of them talk about education. We went ahead and said any state agency, contractor, or subcontractor. That just, we decided to get the whole shooting match. And then we left it to the Department of Labor to decide how to punish folks or, or how to administer what we wanted them to do. I will tell you that we're also talking with the Department of Personnel. They, they want to take over labor's role, and they're pretty excited about it. And uh, I, I'm real pleased they're on board. Uh, very quickly, we talk about divisive concepts. And that's what we're not going to teach in school. One race or sex is inherently superior to another race or sex? It's no go. That this state or the United States is fundamentally racist or sexist? No. That an individual by virtue of his or her race or sex is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive, whether consciously or unconsciously? We're not going to do that. That an individual should be discriminated against or receive adverse treatment solely or partly because of his or her race or sex? And I'll try to make this less painful. There are only a couple of more. Uh, that members of one race or sex cannot and should not attempt to treat others without respect to race or sex. That an individual's moral character is necessarily determined by his or her race or sex. That an individual, by virtue of his race or sex, bears responsibility for actions committed in the past by other members of the same race or sex. 
that any individual should feel discomfort, guilt, anguish, or any other form of psychological distress on account of his or her race or sex. That meritocracy or traits such as hard work ethic are racist or sexist, or were created by a particular race to oppress another race. Uh, that's the nine things that we, we listed. We also talked about some other terms, race or sex, scapegoating. Uh, like I just mentioned, no matter what you say, uh, you're guilty just because of the way you look. Or, or, uh, we're, and the reason it's done so dry and cut like that, and the reason we don't say CRT, is because we don't want the legal challenges. We don't want any First Amendment challenges. We want to pass this bill. And I believe this is our toehold. Uh, I thank Mike Holmes, and uh, of course this is his district. And that's another thing, my kids said, Daddy's driving 30 miles outside his district to go talk to a bunch of people tonight, and, and he ain't pretty. <laughs> so, you know, but uh, I, I thank, thank Mike. Uh, 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 I don't know if you've seen Mr. Ziegler up here or not, but thank him too. This is another issue he feels strongly about. I believe this will be the bill that we carry, and this will be the bill that we pass. Uh, we will meet. Uh, we will have a caucus with the Republicans, and we will talk about what people want to add and subtract. But one reason the bill is written this way is because we know we can pass it. And no matter how good your intentions are, if you can't get it passed in the law, it doesn't help you. So I think this is, this is where we're headed. Our, uh legal, our general counsel was gearing up to write a CRT bill. She's written our free speech bill that passed. She wrote our uh, transgender bill. She's really good at writing bills. She works with a lot of people. And she's had a lot going on. But then we saw Ed's bill and read through it. And she said, hmm, this is pretty good. This has just about everything we want in there. So you've saved her a lot of work. Um, but he said he's open to hearing any suggestions that she has. This is a pre-filed bill, so it won't be heard until the legislature starts again in the spring, or January next year. Okay, along with this bill, Eagle Forum has done a state school board resolution. And you may have heard some hubbub about this. Our general counsel, again, worked with one of our other ladies on writing this excellent resolution, telling the school board, we're not going to teach CRT. Again, they didn't name CRT because what they do is they say, they just change the name and then say, oh, we're not teaching CRT anymore because it went from Common Core to Alabama's college and career ready standards. So again, this is a really great um, resolution. Then we took that resolution and adopted it or changed it so that local school boards could uh, share that as well and could pass those in their areas. So I have a job for y'all to do. They're going to vote on this school board. The ACLU came out and said they don't like our resolution. They're trying to say that we won't allow them to teach history and we're stopping free speech and all this, which is totally not true. So we found out, though, they have received hundreds of letters from the left saying don't pass that resolution at the state school board. And they're not hearing as many from us. So we have this little map. So if you, don't, if you live around here, um, Stephanie Bell is going to be your state school board representative. On the back, every state school board member's email and phone number. I really want you to pick up one of these, and I want you to just email them and just say, please pass the Eagle Forum Alabama Policy Institute resolution. That's all you have to say. You can say anything else you want to say, but form letters don't really get a whole lot, even though they're getting a lot of them. If they saw that you just wrote three sentences and you're, you're a constituent and it's important, we really need you guys to help us get it passed at the state school board level. We also, on our website, if you go to alabamaeagle.org, under the Issues tab at the top, go down to Critical Race Theory. And we have the resolution, we have local resolutions, we have all kinds of really great resources on CRT. One thing that is important for you to find out with your schools, some of you are grandparents in here, so find out, ask your, your kids. Does your, your school where your grandkids are going have a diversity committee? Ding, ding, ding. How is it appointed? 
Are the meetings public? Can you get copies of the minutes? These are really important things that you should know. What kind of teacher training are they doing on diversity or equity? What kind of training are they using? If they do have a committee and they ask them to dissolve it, if they won't dissolve it, try to get on it. That's a good, a good thing to do. Um, and then, again, we, we just have other resources for you. I want to open it up for Q&A now. And All right, Mr. Troy Towns, ask us your question. I actually wrote my qu I have two questions. And the first one is to uh, Representative Oliver, uh, and is how do you enforce this bill once it becomes law? Um, when you're dealing with people that are on the left, doesn't matter what the law is. If they feel like they're right, they're going to do what they want to do anyway. So I want to make sure there is an enforcement component to it. And then secondarily is this is what I'm so frustrated with, being a part of the political scene in this state for probably as long as Kay Carl has, 12 years or so. It seems like we're always dealing with the fruit, never dealing with the root. The root problem is the education system itself. And when are we going to have the courage as a state to get off the federal dollar, educate our own children, come up with our own curriculum, and stop playing this game because the left's going to keep coming and coming and coming? In House Bill 9, and I would encourage anyone to just Google on your phone Alabama legislature and then Allison, L-I-S-O-N, and you click on there and there's all the bills. And this is under pre-file bills. You can all read it. But if you'll go to the very end of the bill, it will tell you that uh, the people that are held accountable are the department heads that run the individual uh, departments. We did it that way because, we're, like I said, getting the bill passed is important. Right now, we do have the personnel department that is trying to write a more stringent set of rules, in other words, to have a better guideline for what punishment is. Uh, what we don't want to do is start threatening to fire these people or threatening to fire these folks. We want to hold leadership accountable for making sure that we institute uh, the, the type of training that we want. So, in, in yeah. When you get in, Allison, uh, when you get... First of all, you need to be sure you're looking in the right year. This bill is pre-filed for 2022. Okay, that's perfect. That's a lot of people waste a lot of time looking in the wrong year and they can't find the bill. And so be sure you're looking in 2022 session. Uh, and then you'll just, just search bill and give the number, HB9, and then you should get there very quickly. And what about the feds? Anyone want to take on that question? Getting federal money out of and letting states... That's a hard one. Well, I would, I would like to comment that we, we've got to quit in this state, and a lot of states that uh, believe like we do, and Florida's doing a lot of it, we've got to quit letting them hold us hostage to federal money. That's just, that's just ridiculous. They, they, we make decisions based on losing federal money. They're not going to do it. They're not going to take the money away. Forget about that. They'll threaten and threaten and threaten, but they're not going to do it. And if you would please write these school board members and ask them to support the Eagle Forum resolution, Here's the numbers. Come on up and get this. Kay Carl and Ed Oliver and Mike Holmes will be here, our representatives, if you want to talk to them. Thank you for coming.